today's topic uh, yeah so we, i think up till this point people have seen different versions of k-theory so this is one of the most general uh, versions of k-theory that we know which is the uh, construction of the k-theory space of waldhausen categories so we'll start out by defining what waldhausen categories are so waldhausen categories as we've given our definition here so it's given by a triple where you have a category C where here the uh, we'll assume the category is small so that we can const we can do cons constructions and still remain in the realm of sets. So C is a small category and CO and W are families of morphisms. Oops. Families of morphisms in C. Uh, so where we call so CO is short for co-fibrations. And W is short for it stands for weak equivalences. So these names are the uh, are holdovers from the fact that this was first described in a very topological setting in terms of co-fibrations and weak equivalences. Uh, yeah, so, but right now C is an arbitrary category and CO and W are just families of morphisms in C uh, that satisfy certain properties. So, let's just scroll down. So, what are these properties that they satisfy? First thing is that both cofibrations and weak equivalences are closed. Under I, they are closed under compositions, meaning if F and G are cofibrations, F composed with G are is also cofibration. Similarly for weak equivalences, and uh, it is closed under identities, meaning that for any object A in C, the identity morphism of A is both a cofibration cofibration and a weak equivalence right and usually so because it has all identities and all uh, compositions we can call cofibrations and weak equivalences as subcategories of c right normally if you're new to category theory the notion of subcategories you think of in terms of shrinking the family of objects but here it's different, right? Co-fibrations and weak equivalences, because they have all identities, have all objects, but you have a smaller family of morphisms. So this is a family of morphisms. You can also call them, because they are closed under compositions and have all identities, you can also call them subcategories of C, right? Both are valid ways of looking at it. So let's scroll down again. So yeah, so this is one property. Uh, this is the first property. And the second property, which is again shared by both cofibrations and weak equivalences is that they have all they are closed under isomorphisms. So every isomorphism is both a cofibration and a weak equivalence. So every isomorphism belongs to both these categories. That's one of the conditions. And again, so that's one can that's another condition. So uh, the next condition is that uh, there exists a distinct zero object. It's a zero object where we fix one such that. For any object A, if you have a zero object, you have a unique map from zero to A. The unique map from this 
This is a cool vibration. For all A. So given any A, the map from uh, the distinguished initial object to A is a co-fibration. And because we are closed under equal isomorphisms and, uh, and compositions, you'll know that if you have any other initial object, and if you have a map here, because this map will be an isomorphism, this will also be a co-fibration, right? So we state it for this distinguished zero object, but in reality, any map from any zero object to any object, uh, the unique map is a co-fibration. And uh, yeah, so, I mean, we'll, I'll first list these properties and then I'll talk, I mean, I'll give you the intuition of where they come from. And I think some of you might have also, who are familiar with some topology can already see where some of this comes from. Uh -huh. But I'll just list these first and then we can talk about uh, where these come from now. Right, so this is a co-fibration. And another property is that co-fibrations Uh, yeah, how do I say this? So co-fibrations are preserved under push-outs. Under push-outs. Meaning that if you have any co-fibration, say here, oh, I forgot to state it uh, ahead, like from, further, from, from this point on, we'll use this uh, this uh, arrow with the tail to denote co-fibration because we don't have to write co-fibration again and again we can use these arrows to denote it. Right? So if you have any co-fibration and any arbitrary map from A to some C, then this push out, first of all, it exists in the category, which may not always be true, but in this case it exists. And second of all, this uh, the, the push out map here, which is parallel to a co-fibration, this map is also a co-fibration, right? And yeah, so there is, there are two particular cases of this, one, uh, two interesting, yeah, there are two interesting cases of this. One is that if you take, say, uh, so if you take any pair of objects, so if you take A and B, take a zero object, there is a distinguished maps here. So what this says that this push out always exists, right? And this push out is the co-product of A and B. So for any object, if you take the maps from uh, the initial object to A and B, and then you take the push out, this map is denoted, uh, this is the push out. So usually you can denote it as A disjoint union E, B, but when you have a disjoint, uh, when you have a zero object, Intuitively, it looks more like the category of pointed sets or something. So we'll use this notation. This is the co-product. So in particular, because all these maps, all the maps from the zero object to any object is a co-fibration, because all such maps are co-fibrations, what we have is that the product, the co-product of, uh, co of A and B always exists for any A and B here. So that's one consequence of this, uh, this statement. Another consequence, oops. I have to add another page, I think. Yeah. Okay. So another consequence, uh, another consequence is that if you have, a, uh, for any object, for any co-fibration, Let's take this. So we are given a co-fibration. Now we can always construct, we can always take A, B, and then we can take the distinguished, uh, yeah, we can take the map. Oops, sorry. It's not co-fibration, but you have a unique map from any A to zero, right? Because it's a zero object. Now this push out always exists. And then we denote this, uh, this push out by B by A, right? So this is like, uh, this is notation comes from algebra where if you have any map, if you have an inclusion, so co-fibrations are meant to mimic inclusions. 
So having inclusion of algebraic objects, say groups from H to G, then you can take you, uh, the push out will just be G mod H, right? So this is that notation. If you guys aren't familiar with it. In that in this cases, we'll actually denote this map with a double arrow like this, right? Which a lot of times is used to denote epimorphisms, but here this is just the push out of along this cofibration. And when you have such maps, right? So we have we'll call the pair of maps A to B double arrow B mod A. So, so sequence of this form, we'll call them cofibration sequences. Sequences. Right? So these cofibration sequences are in, are important because uh, if you, you guys have seen some amount of K3 of exact categories, but not all of them, but you would have known that from what you've seen that uh, exa uh, that K3 up till this point would have mostly the key determining factor of these exact sequences, right? Like we turn uh, either you just look at uh, this uh, split exact sequences or you take exact sequences are not split and then essentially behave like they're split like for, for constructing K0. So cofibration sequences will play the role of exact sequences for an arbitrary Waldhausen category, right? So yeah, right up till this point, we only talked about cofibrations, uh, only a little about uh, weak equivalences. So these are the properties of cofibrations uh, co uh, that has to be satisfied for some for a set of morphisms to be a cofibration. For weak equivalences, you have a couple of properties. One is this. Uh, let's see if this goes down. Yeah. So one. Wow. So you only have two properties. The first property for weak equivalences is that if you have any diagram of this form. A. Yeah, this is an A is an arbitrary map. The map from A to B is a distinguished uh, monomorphism. You have an isomorphism from A to A prime. Then you have again a distinct and sorry, not a distinct. What am I saying? A cofibration from A prime to B prime. And so we'll use this notation here to denote weak equivalences. So if we have a diagram of this form, so if you have a pair of, so you have a triple of weak equivalences of this form, then the induced maps of <coughs> pushouts is a weak equivalence. So actually, a better way, I mean, a nicer way to draw this is in terms of a square. I mean, a cube. You can put like a cube here. Uh, you can put a here, a prime here, b c c prime b prime. Right. So these are equivalences. So you can create the pushouts here again because these are uh, these are again cofibrations. You have pushouts, and the induced map there is a weak equivalent. So if you have a di if you have a diagram like this, then how do I write this? B union C over A to B prime union C prime over A prime is a weak equivalence. So this is one property. Another property which uh, which many people don't include is this two out of three property. Two out of three, where given morphisms, F and G, if you're given two morphisms of F and G, such that out of F G and F composition G, suppose F composition G exists, no, 
my diagram of the wave. Okay, suppose that exists. Yeah, out of F composition F G and F composition G, which was the previous paper. So So yeah, if you are given F, G, and F composition G, if out of this, two, two of them is a weak equivalence, so is the third. So one of these conditions is obviously true, right? So, uh, so F composition G, so if F and G are weak equivalences, then obviously F composition G is a weak equivalence. Uh, we've already seen that weak equivalence are closed into compositions. But we further have that if out of F and G, if one of them is a weak equivalence and F composition G is a weak equivalence, then the, then the remaining one is as well. So sometimes this is not included as an axiom, but most of the... What does this categories we'll deal with will satisfy this axiom. So we might as well include it. Right? So these are all the axioms of a Waldhausen category. So let's go through these. So notice that the, the terms and notations here sort of come from uh, dealing with uh, uh, topological spaces, right? So this looks like co-fibrations and the known language of co-fibrations and weak equivalences comes up. So this this idea of, uh, so this comes from the fact that Waldhausen was trying to extend the uh, techniques from algebraic K-theory, which are mostly used in a more algebraic setting for like algebraic geometry to more to families of topological spaces. So that's why you can see the language is very topological with co-fibrations, weak equivalences, et cetera. So now, first thing we want to do is we want to see what how it compares to the versions of K-theories that um, people have seen before. Right? So, yeah. So let's do that. So what we have is that given any exact category, E, then E mono iso is a Waldhausen category is a Waldhausen category. Where mono is just the distinguished uh, monomorphisms, right? So if you have any exact sequences, so these all belong in belong in mono. And iso is just isomorphisms. Right, so given any exact category, that gives you one example of a Waldhausen category where the cofibrations are these admissible monomorphisms or just the first map in like a short exact sequences, which you consider, and the weak equivalents are just isomorphisms. So obviously, looking at isomorphisms uh, as your weak equivalents is not that interesting. So uh, at the end of the uh, in the second half of this talk today, we'll try to we'll try to give some examples of Waldhausen categories. Uh, with more interesting families of weak equivalences because one of the advantages of Waldhausen uh, construction is that uh, changing the family of weak equivalences allows us to put different Waldhausen category structures on the same underlying category and it gives us different key theories. Right? So, okay. So, yeah. So, let's continue. So, this is, uh, so this is the, so this is the general definition of uh, a Waldhausen category. So we want to define 
the algebraic k theory space of a, some a, a category such as this and this the way we do it is using waldhausen's s dot construction so let's go to that and we will just start in a new page it's already so thing um before going to the construction can you give us an example to keep in mind like a concrete example of a of a world of category. category yeah a concrete one yeah yeah so now yeah the stand, the easy example is that if you take any the if you take any r module uh, so if you take any r is any ring and you look at the yeah yeah so i mean like let's uh, let's for some yeah for r is a ring you look at the you look at the fa the category proj r of of finitely generated projective r modules now yeah this is this is usually called an exact category i mean this is an exact category and if because you haven't seen so i'll write down what the maps are in terms of covariance itself so yeah these are finally generated this category is you no know, this is small theoretic point that this is not small but this is skeletally small what do we say is meaning that i mean technically there are there are there are this class many of there is a large collection of uh, project finally generated project r modules but you can always choose a set such that every other finally generated r module is isomorphic to one of them so you can always reduce the category with something which is small so projective r modules is a skeletally small category so here you can take the co vibrations to be uh yeah so co vibrations are maps p p prime such that uh, so call it f such that f is an inclusion and p prime mod p p prime by p so co vibrations here are inclusions p to p prime such that p prime by p the quotient is also projective right that's why if you do some exact categories they use the phrase admissible monomorphisms because uh you can you have other maps right you can have maps from p to p prime which are injective so inclusions are injective whatever such that the quotient is not a projective mod uh, module those we don't count we only count maps p to p prime so that the quotient is also projective because only then does the push out also exist in the in the in the category of projectives right so we wanted if you look we wanted the prop one of the properties is that the push outs to, should exist so uh, yeah so we wanted so if you have p if you have p to p prime and then any map p to q another projective then this map uh yeah then the push uh, push out here q prime will be i mean will always be a module but when this is a when we know that the quotient here uh is also projective this guarantees that this is also this q prime is also projective uh, yeah th that's that's the only way to guarantee that this q prime is also projective so that exists so co vibrations are just maps uh, maps inclusion such that the quotient is uh, quotient is also a projective r module now obviously the distinguished zero object is just the zero r module which is projected by default now this clearly satisfies the first condition that maps from zero to p are admissible right because here if you take p to be z if you take p to be zero then the quotient is again p prime so obviously it's still projective so it satisfies that condition and yeah these maps are closed under composition which uh, 
so it's which is a it takes a little bit more work but it's not too much more work to show that if you have map p to p prime and then you have map p to p prime to p double prime and then you take the quotient here uh yeah if the quotient here is projective if the quotient here is projective then the quotient of the composite decision is also projective right so that's what we need and you can with a little bit of work you can show that that's true so yeah this satisfies uh, closed under compositions and uh, yeah and push outs so yeah so the other only other properties is about isomorphism i mean the weak equivalences so these are co-fibrations uh, projective modules with these inclusions are the co-fibrations and weak equivalences are just the isomorphisms so weak equivalences are isomorphisms Right, and isomorphism satisfying all these properties are pretty trivial. You can look at those. Because, yeah, so this is a standard example. And in this case, uh, yeah, in this case, uh, wait, go down. So in, in this case, the short exact, uh, the co-fibration sequences, the co-fibration sequences are just short exact sequences. So these are just short exact sequences of projective modules. And let me write it like clearly here. Right, so these are our co-fibration sequences in this case. So this is uh, one case. So let me just give you tease an example of. Uh, let's just give an example of uh, wall dozen categories where the maps are not just isomorphisms, but something. Uh, yeah, something more interesting. Which is that? So we dealt with uh, the category of projective modules. Now. Consider the category CH proj R, the category of the category of uh, chain complexes. Over proj R. Right? Which means that objects here, objects here or sequences, uh, E is not good. P minus one, P zero, P one dot 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 so it's an infinite sequence of maps between projectives such that let's call this d i y d zero etc etc is that d i composite d i minus one is zero so in this case this is called a complex a chain complex and yeah so if you have any so you can for the uh, if you given the category of projective modules you can form the category of chain complex on that projective module and as a side note this makes sense sense for any exact category so instead of projar you can have any e and you can construct chain complex on those and any abelian category. Right? So it starts, you've, originally this was done for abelian categories and we can extend this to all exact categories. We can construct this family of chain complexes. Let's go down. It's not another paper. 
Yeah. So in this case, we can give ch proj uh, yeah so we can give this an exact category structure a wall doesn't category structures we're taking complexes monomorphisms and quasi isomorphisms Where monomorphisms, so if you have two chain complexes, which I'll denote by A dot because you have this indexing and you have another chain complex, B dot. If you have mapped from A dot to B dot, we'll call this uh, we'll call this a monomorphism if the each map AI to BI was monomorphism in the previous sense, meaning that this is an inclusion and the quotient BI. mod AI is also projective. So yeah, these are monomorphisms. And here, instead of uh, isomorphisms, we have quasi-isomorphisms. So given two chain complexes, yeah, so given a chain complex, sorry, first. Firstly, given a chain complex A dot, we get a family of uh, objects in the underlying category here, we're doing a projective R module, so we'll get a family of R modules called, I mean, we'll get a family of not uh, projective R modules generally, but R modules, uh, we'll get a family of R modules called the homology of a, HI of a, a dot, which is defined as, so because by the construction, if you guys have seen, I mean, people have seen chain complex already know this, for those who haven't, you have these maps A minus one to A zero to A one. So because uh, so because both the maps here, which will not by D, so decomposition D is zero. That means the image of the first map here, so the image here lands inside the kernel of the second map. So right, so the homology is defined, the ith homology is defined by, uh, is constructed by taking at AI, you take, uh, yeah, you take the image of uh, DI minus one, sorry, take the kernel of DI, and then you take, you quotient out by the image of DI minus one, And then this is the ith homology uh, module here. It could be, I mean, yeah, it's the ith homology module. Notice that this is an important fact. So I'll write this for note. HIA need not be projective. So even though every term in the sequence is projective uh, of this chain complex, but these uh, homology groups need not be projective. Like you can, con uh, if, as an example, you can try to find counterexamples of chain complex of projective modules where, yeah, these homologies are not projective, right? So these always exist, but that's not a problem for us. So the reason we define this homology is that a map, a morphism, A dot to B dot between chain complexes is a quasi isomorphism is a isomorphism if uh, the induced map on homologies so this map if it's a map of uh, chain complexes meaning that it's a level-wise map. It says that it compose, uh, it uh, it commutes with these D maps, differential maps. If the uh, if this map is a quasi isomer, if the induced map from HI A to HI B dot is an isomorphism for all I. 
right so ultimately the only thing about chain complex we care about are the homologies so when these are homologies are either isomorphic we call them quasi isomorphic we'll say that the chain complex are quasi isomorphic and in most cases in uh, in mathematics when we deal with chain complexes we want to identify chain complexes with the same homology so dealing with the family taking the weak equivalences to be all quasi isomorphisms gives uh, yeah gives us an in interesting example of waldhausen categories which is beyond the case of exact categories right even though technically the even though the category of chain complex of projective r modules is actually in fact an exact category there's no way using uh, in equivalence q constructions to account for the fact that we only care about them up to quasi isomorphisms quasi isomorphisms so this is one of the reasons why we deal with waldhausen k theory right so yeah so this is gives you an example of uh, yeah for waldhausen category which is not an exact category but is related to them as we've seen because it's constructed from this project to r modules right so yeah so we've just uh, up till this point we've just defined what these uh, r mod uh, uh, waldhausen categories are so we'll still need to define what what it is which is the i mean what is the k theory of the, what is the k theory space of these categories so we do that using this s dot construction construction and yeah so how do we go about that so what we'll do uh, so our idea here is we will construct a simplicial category meaning a map from delta of this is the category of simplicial sets to categories call this s dot and the k theory groups k i of our waldhausen category so given right okay, let me make this more clear we will construct a simplicial category s dot of c from delta op to category where c is a waldhausen category where i've suppressed the tuples for like simplicity of notation so we'll construct this and once we are done then we will define the k theory space of c to be the loop space of the geometric realization of in fact wait In fact, what we'll construct is not just s dot, right? We need we'll actually in fact do w of s dot. So what we'll construct. So what this w is will come to later. So this will give you. Uh, so we'll construct k theory space as the realization, the loop space of the realization of s dot of c. Right. So let's unpack what this definition is here. first of all s dot of c as we saw before uh, is a simplicial category so s dot so each s n c each uh, each s n c 
is a category. So this S dot stands in for all the natural numbers. So each S and C will be a category, right? And so we construct this uh, realization of S dot W S dot of C of okay, each W S dot of C, S and C <coughs> is a category. We can take the realization of that. The geometry. So I guess I think you guys would have at this point seen the realization of us uh, of a category. So otherwise, it's also called the nerve. Also called the nerve. Which will give you a simplicial set, right? So for each n, you get a simplicial set, and then you vary n. So so you you will you will obtain we will obtain we then obtain a bisimplicial set so we then obtain a bisimplicial set And then the realization of WS dot C is just the geometric realization of the diagonal of w s dot of c so we're abusing a notation here to simplify things so what we have is to summarize given any simplicial category we can correspond a corresponding uh, by simplicial set by taking the nerve of each category so you will get a by so we get a by simplicial set and the geometric realization of a by simplicial set so if you want again uh, like an example here so given any x double dot by simplicial set, set, we can construct the diagonal of x double dot such which is a simplicial set such that x double dot of i is just x i comma i. So we'll have a simplicial set whose ith corner is just i comma i here. And we can also check that the maps are also compatible to make this into a simplicial set. And yeah, and then the geometric realization of x double dot is defined to be the geometric realization of this diagonal x double dot. Yeah, as a simplicial set. So we know how to take the geometric realization of a simplicial set. So a by some so the geometric realization of a bisimplicial set is just to take its diagonal and then take the realization, right? So this gives us ultimately a topological space in that sense. So we should take the diagonal after you take the realization, and then K theory is just defined to be its uh, loop space. So loop space is defined in so so if you are not familiar, a loop space of a space X. Is a topological space which has this property that pi i of of any loop space of x is just pi pi i plus one of x, right? So the loop space or topological space is a topological space that satisfies the property that the ith homotopy group of the loop space is just the ith plus one homotopy group. Of the original topological space and yeah so yeah so this gives you a breakdown of what uh, k theory will construct as is so this is this property right so now let's look at what this uh, uh, look at what this s dot construction actually is so what it does it uh, yeah what does it give us Us S dot construction.
Yeah, so what does this x dash construction give us? Yeah, so so again, x dot is a simplicial, uh, is a simplicial category, so we want to define first as n of c to be a category. So s dot, so in a sense, s dot of c is equivalent to giving all these essence of c's plus uh, face and diagonal maps between them, right? Oh, this is a bad way of writing. Right, so we have this essence of C. So each one of them has to be a category. So what is S N? Uh, so what is S N C? The objects of S N C are sequences or diagrams. Sorry, of the form. Right, so let me draw. I'll take some. I need some more space. Yeah, so there are diagrams of the form. Let's denote these objects by a dot again. So they're defined by taking zero is equal to a zero. So this is the distinguished zero object in the Ozan category. We have a family of distinguished, sorry, family of co-fibrations up to some a n so we have this plus a choice sorry a choice of quotient a i comma j of a j mod a i. So that means that we have this sequence of a i's plus a choice of these co elements in the push outs. So z a i a j. So yeah, because we have maps for any i less than for any i less than j. Because of this, uh, because of the sequence, you have map from AI to AJ, which is uh, the composition of cofibrations and hence a cofibration. And then we take the push out to get AJ mod AI. Sorry, AJ mod AI. Sorry. Yeah, and this quotient is what we call AI comma AJ. Sorry, AI comma J. So for so we have a diagram or we have a sequence of these cofibrations plus a choice of these uh, uh, these quotients. This is sometimes nicely succinctly. We can give this by another diagram, which is a zero goes to a one goes to a two. Plus to blah 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 to a n, and then we take we draw these diagrams here, where we take a one comma zero, which is again zero. This will also be, because this is zero. This lower one will also be zero because this is just yeah. Here, here, this will be a a one comma two. Similarly, we have something something here. You'll have a a one comma n. Yeah, after all the dots, you have one comma n. And similarly, we can go up till here, and then you'll have, have a n comma n. And then you'll have a shrinking family of uh, triangles here. 8, 2, comma 0, blah, blah, blah. 
so yeah so you can give this lopsided uh, yeah upper triangle i mean like an upper triangle sort of diagram which will come uh, which uh, yeah which comprise all this information right so these diagrams are the ob objects of sc and morphisms are just morphisms which are compatible with uh, these maps so you just take two of these diagrams as diagrams and you just take any morphism between them that is uh, there that commutes with these pictures and then that will give you the category s dot c and the weird thing is that each s yeah so that is sn and then we have to define the face and diagonal maps so face and diagonal maps uh, they i mean they are the intuition intuitive ones right like so they at the end points so you can uh, to see the face and diagonal maps you can just look at this sequence just here yeah as you can see this sort of looks like the nerve construction right in only instead of taking all maps we are just taking co fibrations so most of the face and degeneracy maps are like the nerve construction where you just compose all of them right so when you have the uh, when you have the degeneracy maps uh, so when you have the face maps you add an identity just like in the nerve case and there's a degeneracy you just remove uh, you just uh, compose one of them and remove that from between between but the only difference is like at the end points here so we have the final face so let's do the to the case where you have to let's do the case where you have right like so let's look at so here from this notion from what we've seen so from what we've seen s0 of a category is just the unique zero object right because you just have this a0 here so it is just a single object uh, and uh, yeah the single morphism there s1 or c is actually isomorphic to, uh, i mean is equivalent to c as a category because its objects are just diagrams of this form s2 so a distinguished triangle and sorry not b just a zero again right so ultimately only a matters so this is a category equivalent to the category c itself right so this is equivalent to c itself and if you look at s2 so s2 as a category has zero a1 a2 right sorry not a, not here i mean it's also co fibration a2 and the choice of push out here so this is just a21 so this is in fact just the category of co fibration sequences so the i mean all these are all distinct zero objects so the only real objects only real entries are a1 a2 and a2 comma 1 so this is just uh, yeah this is just the category of uh, co fibration sequence in s this s1 i mean in c so from this uh, yeah so we want to look at the face and degeneracy map from s2 to s1 so that should just give you because this is uh, you have two and you have one here there are so uh, let me just keep this here right so the maps are the phase maps are so you have three phase maps which just give you a1 a2 and a2 comma 1 from s2 to s1 which will give you here and the degeneracy map is just you look at a sorry those are the disorder yeah and the other way maps are given by you take a a to just the identity here so that's the other way map from the lower one to the upper one so that is the face map so yeah so yeah the degeneracy map or is just you just forget this no oh no sorry yeah no i was getting it wrong yeah the face maps are the face the faces of this diagram are a1 a2 and a2 comma 1 and the degeneracy map is one where you assign to each a just a identity here which is also a co fibration and then zero here again right 
and yeah the, so these notions you can generalize to arbitrary sn there are nice ways to extend this to get these higher sns as well so those will all give you these so yeah so in so hence you can yeah so what you do is similarly we get s and c for each n and putting them together putting them together we get a simplicial category is dot c which is in fact a simplicial waldhausen category so what do i mean by that is that that is each snc has the structure of a waldhausen category so each of them have this as uh, structure of a waldhausen category where how do i say this yeah so effectively so yeah so each sn actually has the structure of a waldhausen category where effectively the maps are just you take the yeah so you took the you take how do i write this so if you are given sn and you are given one of these objects a dots you want to know what the monomorphisms are so the monomorphisms are maps which are level wise monomorphisms meaning that each a i comma j to each b i comma j you have a monomorph i'm oh, sorry but i keep saying monomorphism it's a co vibration if each a i comma j to b a comma i comma j is a co vibration uh plus you have this additional condition wait i have to check this once and i write it down Hmm. Yeah, sorry, these are still yeah. Hmm, what is the condition? Yeah, so this so each one of these is a co vibration plus the added property that if you have yeah so if you have any uh, a dot to b dot uh, so if this map and then you are given an arbitrary c dot we have a condition that guarantees that the map from a i j to b i j so ci uh yeah what was the okay, let's not go into this so these are monomorphisms so that the condition is a bit technical so let's just keep this as so a monomer uh, so sorry a co vibration i keep getting these two messed up so in each sn a map from a dot to b dot 
the core vibration if each a i j to b i j is a core vibration and and uh, yeah for any k comma l you have a map a i j a j b i oops b i j to a k l so if you have any map of this form uh, if you have a uh, if you have a quotient map of this form then the induced map here whatever this is is also a core vibration so if you have a morphism between a dot to b where is a core vibration if it satisfies this property that each of these level map map is a core vibration and this push out is also a core vibration yeah so then these maps are core vibrations and weak equivalences are just level wise weak equivalences that the maps from aij to bij are weak equivalences let's say that plus weak equivalences are level wise then this uh, then s dot c s and c these co vibrations and weak equivalences is a is a wall dozen category So then W S dot C that we saw before is just uh, is just the simplicial category whose at each n is just the weak equivalences of S I C, meaning you have these weak equivalences. It's a level wise weak equivalences, we denote them by W S N of C or just this level wise weak equivalences and then you put them together you get ws dot of c and the k theory space is defined to be the loop space of ws dot of c All right so on the face of it this is more of complicated definition than the in the case with quillens q construction or the plus construction you guys have seen but what advantage this construction has that it allows us to deloop this uh, this k theory space. So, so what we'll what we end up doing is that. Oops. So because we have this fact that uh, s dot of c is again a Waldhausen category, we can construct. We can construct such the Waldhausen by category uh, S dot S dot of C which is just defined by doing the s dot construction level wise so s dot s dot of c so s n that which that is i e s n of s dot of c is uh, so there's no way easy way to write this so this is a by all dozen by category where s dot of s dot of c i comma j is just you do s i of s j of c so given any wall dozen category c s j of c is a wall dozen uh so it's a wall dozen yeah so each s j of c is a wall dozen category 
and then you can take SI of SJ of C, which is again still a Waldorf category. So you get pairs SI SJ of C, and in fact, like we can, uh, so we can re, yeah. So in fact, we can do this. Do this. recursively to get s dot n so n c which is defined to be s dot of s dot blah 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 s dot of n s dot of c n times so this is an n simplicial category and we can define the realization of an n simplish category similar to the way we define the realization of a bi simplish category by taking the diagonal. And yeah, and we can define its geometric realization accordingly. And just like in the uh, case of s dot of c, this again will give you a wall dozen categories. So we can construct. Oops. So we can construct the topological space the realization of W F S N dot C. So for each N, we can do this S N dot C, which is an N simplicial category. We take uh, n simplicial Waldorf category. We take the weak equivalence in that n simplicial Waldorf category, and then with and then we take its geometric realization, which will give you an object here. Now again, the question is why? Why do we do this? Because again, this will give you more and more complicated structures. What this ends up doing is that it gives you a de-looping of uh, uh, Waldorf categories. What that what that means? We have, so we have a theorem, so we have, we have for any Waldorf category, a weak a homotopy equivalence We have a homotopy equivalence between the geometric realization of WSN dot of C and the loop space of WSN plus one dot of C. So we have a so we have a homotopy equivalence of the uh, this nth construction and to the n plus one construction as so. And so, if you guys have, if you guys have seen the the theory of, uh, if you have, if you guys are familiar with stable homotopy theory, you'll know that. Therefore, we get an omega spectrum. Uh, we get. space of w s dot of c then you give w s dot of c oh, wait let's write no but let's just write this clearly oops i need a new page i think yeah we get a spectrum where the objects are given by the loop space of W is dot of C and 
W S dot of C W S dot two of C dot dot dot. So as we know, and this makes sense because there is an nice isom as there is a homotopy equivalence from W S N. Oops. Yeah, W S N dot C to Omega. W S dot N plus one C. Right, so this gives us maps. Uh, so if you take the adjoint, it'll give you a map from S1, smash this term to this term, and the conjugate is this map is omega. So such an object is called an omega spectrum. And uh, uh, and in particular, what this means is that uh, the loop space of WS dot C is an infinite loop space. So the K theory space can be delooped infinitely many times. So as you guys know, uh, yeah. So if you're familiar, this also, this is, yeah. So this is the advantage over Quillen's construction is that you you don't, you don't just get a space, you get a loop, uh, you get a spectra, you get an omega spectrum, which are much more behaved than our general topological spaces. So that's one advantage of doing uh, Waldorf's so construction. Here, Right, so we're we are a bit short on time, so I won't go into the de details of how this isomorphism is constructed because it's very technical. Uh, why this you have homotopy equivalence here? We won't go into that today, but let's instead talk about how this deals with uh, the Q construction that you might have heard about a little bit, but not too much. Is that yeah? So we have that this is a theorem. For any exact category E with Waldhausen category structure as above. So the one we just discovered for Waldhausen, for any So we have a Waldhausen structure for any exact category as we've discussed. We have that. Then the K is the the k uh, the simplicial space here, ws dot of c, where I write it as, okay, e here, here. I write it as i because the weak clones are just isomorphisms, is weakly equivalent to the q construction of the exact category. And hence, the definitions of K-theory space are equivalent. So this will give us the uh, uh, K-theory of any equivalent exact category if you start with an exact category and you use the Quillen construction, it'll give you the same K theory. Uh, it'll give you a K theory space which is homotopy weakly equivalent to the K theory space given by Waldhausen's S dot construction. So this is, yeah, so in that special case, we get it back. And in particular, if you want to deal with just the category of projective R modules, you will get back K theory space, I mean, the the K groups of the underlying ring as we usually define it. Yeah, because that's also equivalent to Quillen's K theory structure there. 
so these are the yeah so so yeah this is just a special case so we get back the exact categories now of course the advantage here is that in the in when we use Walters and categories the 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 definition of Walters and categories we can extend this and not just have just exact categories but exact categories is the equivalences in fact we defined this category of uh chain complexes right so we do so where is this let's go up Right, so we define this category of chain complexes uh, from this category of projective mo modules. And in fact, I just made this comment that you, it makes sense for any, uh, you can make this category of chain complexes over any exact category. So we can ask what is the, go back down. Let's add. Yeah, consider uh, again the chain complexes of some exact category or let's keep it grounded and look at projective R modules. And then the mono monomorphisms are the co-fibrations and quasi-isomorphisms are the weak equivalences. So we can construct the K-theory of this. Let's suppress this side and then the rest is Oh, wait, let's not, right? You can look at projective R modules, complexes on projective Rs, monomorphisms, and quasi-isomorphisms here. So you can construct this K-theory space here. And we can ask, what is the relationship between this and K-theory of, uh, of just taking projectives, right? <coughs> Sorry. Oh yeah, I was looking at yeah. So yeah, it turns out that in this case, when you have wait, I just have to check my notes for something. Oops. Sorry. Ah, uh, right, yeah, uh, this condition. Right, so, right, so we have this category of chain complexes, uh, I mean, perfect chain complexes over, sorry, we have the category of uh, chain, uh, projectives, uh, the chain complex over category of projectives. Now, there is obviously a map from the category proj R, to the category of chain complexes, chain complexes where you send each projective module, R module, to just the the boring chain complex, which is just take at zero it is p and uh, and it's zero everywhere else, right? It's infinitely zero. Blah blah blah, right? 
and the k and the k theory of this complex is in is in general not the same as the k theory of projar as an exact category but if we deal with just bounded chain complexes so if we take let ch b projar be the category of bounded chain complexes meaning that it's just a set of all chain complexes that that is chain complexes which are eventually zero at both ends meaning usually we can have a chain complexes which uh, i mean have infinitely many terms but bounded chain complexes are those which both the left and right eventually just become zero so if you take this then you can give this a waldhausen structure by just limiting the waldhausen structure on just chain complexes to bounded chain complexes then the k theory space of bounded chain complexes of projective r modules is equivalent to the k theory of just projective r modules or just the k theory space of the ring r usually so the waldhausen k theory of this bounded projective r modules with again in this case it's not just isomorphisms there are quasi isomorphisms as in the non bounded case will give you back the k theory space of r modules right and the reason is that for, uh, if you if you want to see in the future some uh, you would have seen a lot of theorems about k theory of rings and then in the future you'll see some next other lectures you'll see k th theorems about k theory of schemes and a lot of them are easier to prove for chain complexes than they are for just rings and schemes etc i mean or, i mean projective modules or vector bundles or whatever it's easier to prove them for chain complexes so replacing the replacing just the category of projective r modules with the category of bounded bounded projective r modules uh, 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 gives us much more flexibility and in fact oh yeah i'll just say this one thing before i stop we don't actually have to do just take uh, bounded projective r modules yeah let uh let uh, perfect perfect r be the category of all chain complexes of finitely generated r modules which are quasi isomorphic to a bounded chain to wait to an object in bounded chain complexes on projar so we are not just looking at uh, bounded uh, bounded chain complexes where each term is a projective r module we are looking at any complex which is quasi isomorphic to some uh, su such a such a complex then take perfect r perfect r modules with uh, some co corresponding family of monomorphisms where we have to define them and if you take quasi isomorphisms then oops. so the k theory of this space this perfect r module space this i mean this this also waldhausen in category then the k theory space of the perfect r modules is actually isomorphic to the k theory space of bounded projective r modules this is sort of intuitively see because we only care about things up to isomorphism and everything here quasi isomorphisms and everything here is already quasi isomorphic to everything here so that's pretty intuitive and in fact this is the category 
that we most deal with when you want to compute key theory of uh, some projective R modules, etc. So there's like a couple of minutes left, so maybe I'll just stop for questions or something. Yeah. Thank you.